and welcome. Today I am interviewing Yolandi Horak, author of the Fall of the Mantle series. Hello, <laughs> happy Sunday. <laughs> Um, so the first, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with a really difficult one, and if you can't think of an answer, we can come back to it. <laughs> um, why do you write? I don't know. <laughs> it's a difficult question to answer. I mean, I write because I I think it's my call. I don't think it's my calling. I know that it is my calling. This is what I am supposed to be doing with my life. Like, even if nobody ever reads anything that I put out there, just the act of crafting this world and these characters it brings me so much joy it's like I don't know what makes me a person <laughs> it's like why do you breathe because you have to this is how I feel about writing um it's it's just it's everything to me so that leads into can you tell us about what you're currently working on I'm currently working on the third installment of the fall of the mantle series the book is called a curse of venom and scales and that's very like <laughs> dramatic and dark um fall of the mantle is a series set in a world kind of similar to ours except it has two moons it has like uh, a country based very heavily on england and the uk a country based very heavily on france and then like i have parts that are based on the Middle East and like Japan. There's a very big uh, Japanese area. And then uh, the main kingdom is cut off from the rest of the world by a <laughs> force field. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, basically a plague breaks out and these people are stuck under this force field with a plague. And, you know, there's a lot of spies and like intrigue. And also Vikings. You left out the Vikings did leave out the vikings oh my goodness and they're one of the most important parts of this story <laughs> so the main story in the first book is um, about a girl who has to hide her identity basically because she's royalty if, yeah and people discover that she is alive and she's not dead like she's supposed to be then she will very soon become <laughs> dead like she is supposed to be <laughs> she's also she's also very interested in medicine so can you tell us more about like that aspect okay so Kara is a physician's apprentice not because she chose to be but because it's the easiest way to hide her um I I was very intrigued by the idea that in Victorian times there was this small period of time where blondes weren't considered like the pinnacle of beauty and brunettes became really sought after just for a small small while and then blondes came back <laughs> so I was really fascinated by the idea of being dark haired myself that like there was a period of time where brunettes were the thing to be and not blondes had more fun and so I, I, I wrote this entire thing based on the idea that dark hair is very very scarce and like everyone is blonde um, in, you know, this part of the world, everyone is naturally blonde. And then the dark haired people are very rare and it's like a, a unicorn kind of thing. And so, of course, she has to be dark haired and, you know, people will know immediately if they see her dark hair that she is royal. So she has to hide her hair. And um, I had to th think of like professions where people have to hide their hair, like making food or whatever. I don't know anything about that. And I've always been fascinated by medicine. Um, so I thought, you know, yeah, it would be cool if she had to hide her hair as a physician's apprentice. Of course, like a lot of this idea comes from a Doctor Who episode. I know this is really crazy and far out, but there were these these cat uh, cat sisters, medicine people in one of the episodes, and they had these really cool like habits and like they I don't know what you call it, but they were in these robes and their hair was covered and it was really cool. So this inspired that idea, and uh, and yeah, Kara ends uh, Kara ends up being a physician's apprentice um, because it's the easiest way to hide her hair. And um, she's forced into the medicine world by her sister who wants to hide her. Um, and she ends up really loving, be, loving being an apprentice and loving healing people. Um, so there's a lot of medical element, uh, elements in this book and in the series um, because of that, like you can expect 
people to be doing surgery. <laughs> Is that Grey's Anatomy meets Downton Abbey meets, meets the Americans Game of or <laughs> meets Game of Thrones? <laughs> it's all over the show. <laughs> you put it that way, it sounds really insane, but um, I think uh, I think it's fresh. You don't really yeah, see a lot unique. of medical. Yeah, there's, there's nothing else like that out there. And that's what, that's what a lot of the people who have read your book I've seen in the reviews, like a lot of people say that, like it really, really sticks with you because it's so different. It's like this mashup of different things. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Gasland so, fantasy, you borrow from everywhere. So that's also where your naming scheme comes in. So like the, the first book is the study. The second book is the trial. The third book yeah. is the... Of course. <laughs> um, so the first book is uh, because she's still an apprentice. She's she's studying. Um, and like you, uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but um, the the idea of why she's studying Ash and Smoke does reveal itself as you read the novel. And because I I I didn't know how to make it clear in the first book, I actually clarified this in the second book. Um, and then the second book is like medical trials, also lots of trials for Kara and the rest of the characters. And the third book deals with a blood curse. Um, once you start to learn about the characters, it'll clarify itself too, but like they think it's a curse of blood um and that's where the the idea and the name of the book comes from who is your favorite character and can you tell us more about them oh, i mean <laughs> you, can do, you can do more than one character you don't have to pick a favorite baby <laughs> I really love Kara. I mean, she is the protagonist. So if I hated her, it would be not very successful to write her. She's mentally ill um, and, and she deals with a lot. She she thinks a lot like I do. And I think um, that's why like I have a very soft spot for her. But if I have to talk about the larger cast, I have been very vocal about how much I love Pointy before. Um, Pointy is one of Nathan's friends. Now, Nathan is Kara's mentor in the first book he takes over her apprenticeship and he teaches her about medicine and stuff and pointy is nathan's best friend he's this like uh mordian uh you know nobleman now <laughs> mordian is like my french mordu is like my french country so he's this typical frenchman um <laughs> without you know insulting anyone by saying that but uh, he's he's the he's the life of the party, and he's also a physician. And then later, it is revealed that he is not only a physician, but he is a spy. And I think that's part of the reason why I love writing him so much is because he always knows more than he's supposed to know, and he likes rubbing it in people's faces. Pointy is the lovable rogue trope <laughs> in a character. So like he's like the court rake. He sleeps around a lot. He says things, you know that might not be um, appropriate to say all the time but uh, he does it in a funny kind of tongue-in-cheek way and that's why I really really enjoy writing this character um, and then in the second book he actually joins the cast as a viewpoint character um, and he has been one of the most popular characters I've ever written <laughs> everybody loves pointy so yeah it's a lot of fun um, and then I also really love Vendla who is the Devaran chief queen so she is the leader of my viking tribe people and um, she's just this no bullshit take no prisoners she tells it like it is kind of mother figure and um, I just absolutely adore her. You mentioned earlier that Kara is mentally ill um, do you want to talk more about that? Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm neurodivergent myself, and um, I feel like there are not a lot of characters out there who are, who fit the bill. Like, you get your kick-ass, you know, badass female character, which is like all the rage right now. Um, and I came out and I wrote a character who has panic attacks and a character who has anxiety um, and who is depressed and like who worries about everything. And she she has these little compulsions, like when she gets very stressed, she has to clean, which is 100 percent me. She gets that from, you know, her maker. Um, so uh, and, and like what was really interesting to me is how many people initially straight up called her weak. Um, because, you know, 
she's she's a little bit broken and i think that all of us are a little bit broken and it must be really uncomfortable to see yourself on a page that way if you have panic attacks and anxiety but i just wanted to write someone who was more like me um you know who is relatable and it's very important to me to talk about these things and to break the stigma of like mental illnesses and you know to to have more people out there in the world who are like have adhd or have ocd or have you know autism or whatever um and i think it's very important and i think more of us should be doing it and um just you don't ever really see characters actually working through their mental stuff and trauma in fact fantasy it's not something that you come across because of this like in the, the third book Kara starts going to therapy and she actually also starts using anxiety medication um, because I think it's important to normalize these things because you know um, too many people out there are trying to hide what they are going through um, and you know we need to break the stigma we, we need to make this accessible and to make it okay for people to seek help if they need it and stuff like that wow that's awesome do you have any ideas about what you will do when the Fall of the Mantle series is finished? I don't know. I actually kind of cried about this the other day. I know it sounds absolutely insane because I have five books planned and I'm in the third book now, but I cried because I don't want the series to end. So um, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it, um, but it'll probably be something steampunky and it'll probably have medical elements too. It'll probably arrive in the middle of the night and you won't be able to think of anything else, even though you're still yes. just the mantle. This sounds accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have to worry about that. I think you have to worry oh. about it arriving too early. <laughs> um, what is the first thing you remember writing? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so I was completely obsessed with Al Capone when I was young. Okay. <laughs> Let me just put this out there. <laughs> How young are we talking? <laughs> It's like, I don't know, from age 11 upwards, I was just obsessed <laughs> with the idea of like the mafia. So I went on this like research like rabbit hole and like I found out everything I possibly could about Al Capone and the mafia. So I wrote this story about a mobster's daughter when I was about maybe 13 and like <laughs> it's the worst thing the world has ever seen because like people's legs get broken, but they <laughs> like the kneecaps get broken but they magically walk after a few weeks like it's completely insane but yeah I, I remember it clearly I think the protagonist's name was something like I don't know Michaela or like Tiffany she had a real um a cheerleader name <laughs> not Italian at all and her dad was this mobster <laughs> so yeah that was the first thing that I remember writing that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous is what it is <laughs> but you know whatever well, what are you gonna do I was I was obsessed with Sweeney Todd when I was nine so okay <laughs> you know, if anyone's gonna just, understand just me. <laughs> yeah I, I don't know I was obsessed with weird things like I went through this Egypt phase where everything was Egypt and then I really got into Greek mythology so it was Greek mythology and then from there it went like Al Capone and then it went back to Greek mythology. I always keep on coming back to Greek mythology. You need so, to write a Greek, a Greek inspired, Greek myth inspired story. I really do. It would be great. I, I recently played Hades and I thought, uh, you know, it, it's all these Greek gods and things yeah, and I great. thought it would be really cool if you could put like um, Zagreus and all of them in a modern day setting and do something really cool with that. But then I realized, you know, Percy Jackson this has been done well it's so, because, like, <laughs> there are a number of I mean it's kind of a genre like it's not yeah. just Percy Jackson and yeah. that means that it's fair pickings <laughs> it won't be exactly the same it'll be like something with mafia influences yeah. <laughs> and steampunk exactly. like steampunk 80s and Persephone there you <laughs> go really cool. yeah. you heard it here first folks <laughs> unrelated to that is your favorite tools of the trade I mean I'm very straightforward I use google docs and I use word <laughs> this is how I write I don't really have I know other people have like all kinds of special things and special notebooks I do collect notebooks I mean I'm a writer but I don't actually ever write in there <laughs> so <laughs> all the pretty notebooks but they're all empty 
Um, and and yeah, I don't I don't have special pens and stuff. I use Word. Um, there's a few websites I can link you if you'd like. But I mean, um, there's a few sites that I like to use. I use name generators uh, because a lot of my stuff is set in like pseudo France or pseudo Japan or like pseudo England. Um, I found this one really cool name generator that makes up names based on uh, parts of actual town names of whatever area you want to generate it for so that's really helpful because I don't actually speak French a lot of people are surprised to learn this but I don't actually speak French I make up all of this stuff as I go along uh, and these name generators are really really cool but I mean yeah I, I can't think of anything else you live in Canada now so how long is it until you do speak French <laughs> Um, I, I'm trying to learn. Um, I think that uh, when once my kid starts learning French in school, then it would be really helpful if I actually have a rudimentary understanding of it so that I can help her. So I, I am trying to learn. I'm also trying to learn German in between. So I mean, <laughs> it's it's when you find time. Like trying to learn it, languages at once. <laughs> It's very confusing, but um, I'm, I'm farther along with German, so it's, I mean, German is not an easy language to learn. I'm, I'm not going to be funny about it or anything. It's just, it's, it's like insane. It's insane. And the tenses too, they are very, very complicated. So, um, I mean, I speak Afrikaans and English. Um, Afrikaans doesn't have tenses. It's very straightforward. It's like one or the other. It's like uh, uh, past, present or future. Um, English is a little bit more complicated, but then there's German and like it's, it's all over the show. So French, I mean, too, it's, it's completely because um, Germanic and, and like Latin languages are completely different when you try to learn them. So yeah, I mean, it, it is complicated, but I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying my best. Not as difficult as the first question, but how do you find your inspiration? You've partly answered it already, but maybe in more general terms, what do you usually, where do you usually go for inspiration when you're having a bit of a slow, a slow patch? Um, I game. When I, when I feel terrible, I surround myself by other brilliant storytellers. A lot of the influences of this book actually comes from the Dragon Age franchise, People, Bioware. Um, they told this absolutely amazing story and they crafted this world that is like bigger than anything else you've ever been in. And like, I enjoy going there. Um, I also read. I mean, I listen to music and um, I walk in nature. Uh, inspiration sometimes comes from the weirdest places. Like the main, um, the main inspiration for uh Fall of the Mantle specifically was a SciShow video on YouTube about uh, the five most deadliest viruses out there and like um, the idea that a virus could bring you know people to its knees was just more than a war or anything was just really fascinating to me okay I started writing this not knowing that I was going to live through a pandemic myself <laughs> so I'm not so fascinated by it anymore <laughs> I'm kind of tired of it right now but uh, that's what inspired this entire series so I mean it comes from the most random places um, and then you've also just touched on this, but how do you feel your other hobbies influence your writing? So you, you mentioned gaming and reading, obviously, um, but you're also an artist. I, I'm weird in that regard that I, I don't actually really draw pictures from my books and I don't really actually see a lot of what I write in my mind like other writers can tell you they they see this thing and it it plays off in their mind like a movie I'm not like that there are certain scenes that I can see certain things that are tangible to me so art hasn't really my own art hasn't really influenced my writing but um sometimes you know you'll see a picture some someone else made and it will be like oh okay yeah I can see that uh, I don't know I'm very weird in that regard um <laughs> maybe I'm a little bit broken there, there are a number of authors who I've heard have the same thing where like because I have a very visual like I write basically what I see but um I've spoken mm -hmm. to a number of other authors who don't have that like they see they actually see the words so you're not alone in that and you're not broken it's just that <laughs> <laughs> I have been drawing more um of my characters now because there has been like people have asked me 
to do it. So I've, I've been drawing more fall of the mantle kind of stuff and I like doing it, but it feels like it's after the fact. I look at my own descriptions of the characters to get them right because I, I can't visualize them. I can visualize some of the things like um, I can see the mantle. Um, it's purple and it's swirly and I, I can totally see That's how this is supposed field. to look. It's the force field. Yeah, <laughs> it's called the mantle. Um, and I can see the monolith is like this enormous pillar thing. It's like a copper pillar in the middle of the main kingdom, Eland. Um, and it's very, very tall. And this is the thing that projects the mantle. Like I can picture it. I can see the skyline of the city. Um, so, and like, I can picture the, the automotives, which is like tiny little train locomotives that the people in Eland use to travel. Um, each, like we have cars, they have automotives. Um, and like, I can picture those things, but the characters, I, I don't really know. Like I recently made this connection that Vendla is basically Lucy Lawless, um, who used to be Xena back in the day, Xena warrior princess. And now that I have made this connection that Vendla is Lucy Lawless, like I can picture her. But before then, there was nothing. <laughs> so that's all I have by way of like prompts and questions. Um, and is there anything Sorry. else that you want to say about the books or writing or your art or like? Um, you know, if you're looking for something to read, <laughs> you consider checking out this really weird and like eclectic series that has medicine and politics and like mental illness and steampunk elements it's all over the show but it's my book baby and I really really love it um we actually just uh between Tallulah and I we actually just rebranded the series and uh they are out with brand new really really beautiful covers so uh I would really appreciate if you check that out <laughs> and you also have a patreon now uh, yes, I do have a Patreon page. Um, on I have various tiers, and like uh, you, you can get anything from printable stuff, uh, like sticker sheets and bookmarks, and all kinds of other goodies, uh, to coloring pages. And then I also talk a little bit about my writing. Um, I'm planning to start a podcast in the near future where I will just talk about writing-related stuff. But so my patrons also get um, behind-the-scene snippets of my writing and like never-before-seen other stuff, like <laughs> very old, unedited content, um, or I. I will write you know um short stories with the characters and do all kinds of other stuff so if you really like my writing that would be a great way for us to connect <laughs> yeah and the art is also awesome uh, oh, thank you. So, much, so much stuff for my bullet journal from that patreon it's really one of my best investments <laughs> yeah i'm glad you like it <laughs> yeah my bullet journal is now just like yolandi themed oh. <laughs> That's awesome. I try to, I actually think of you when I'm designing everything, oh, like, would so you not be able to use this? Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I don't know, I don't have a bullet journal. Maybe it's something that I should try someday. You should. They're, it's amazing because organizing your to-do list and being creative, like it's a little creative outlet that you can do every day. So it's like the two things. It's like making to-do lists fun. <laughs> I find to-do lists fun anyway. <laughs> so just imagine how much fun you'd have with a bullet journal. <laughs> you'd be a bullet journal. Like my list of little doodles. It sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah, maybe I should really look into this. <laughs> I thank you for agreeing to do this interview. It's uh, it's really fun to chat about bookish stuff. I always enjoy talking to you about bookish stuff. I enjoy talking to you too. <laughs>